We serve over 700 kids in Honduras, um, which is just mind-blowing. Just ma it's just making a better learning environment for the kids uh, by painting, uh, building some bookshelves, fixing the desks so they don't have to share desks, and making the furniture that the kids have to sit at a little more comfortable. These are very uh, tight communities and worse but travels very quickly. So a lot of times they'll come over and it gives us the opportunity to engage in conversation and say, hey, we're doing this because the Lord called us here to do this for you. This is why I'm here. I'm here serving the Lord. Do you know him? The church can best support this team, obviously by lifting them up in prayer, just covering down um, that entire team in prayer. Go, go to the fundraisers that our teams are having so, and support us financially if possible, because uh, for a lot of people, that's a, it's, it's, it, that's a difficult part. It's, it's the roadblock. So that way we can you know, meet those where they're at and introduce them to Jesus. So that way we can reach the lost and, and take their hand and, and help them become disciples, help them become followers and believers and lovers of Christ um, and show them all the good that he's done in our lives. Oh man. So actually, the Honduras team left yesterday. Um, so why don't we, uh, you know, join together and, and, and pray for them throughout this week, especially? And in fact, would it be okay if we just start together today praying for them? Is that all right? You good with that? All right, let's do it. Jesus, we we lift up to you that team that is in Honduras as they have gone. Jesus, because you tell us to go. They, they have gone to share hope, to share your joy, to serve. So God, we pray that you would bless them, give them favor, guide them, and that you would protect them as they are over there. Lord, would you uh, open the paths. So they, would, they would be able to share your message to the people who you want to hear and the people they preach to, they would be ready to hear that, especially the kids that they're sharing your gospel with, Lord, that it would plant in their hearts and grow so that they could just come closer to you day after day, Lord. Your word transforms, so be with that team as they preach your word. And God, be with us today as we hear what you have to say to us. We want to be transformed as well, Lord. So we pray all this in your name, and we are grateful, and we say amen. Um, so do you guys like poker? It's, uh, I was going for the most awkward transition possible, and I figured that would be it. So about 10 years ago, I really am going to talk about poker. So about 10 years ago, uh, if you turned on ESPN2 or ESPN3, the thing that was always on was poker, the World Series of Poker. It became like this huge phenomenon uh, that, that, that it was being televised. And I got to tell you, I am not much of a gambler, and by that, to say I don't gamble at all because I'd probably be terrible at it. Uh, but I, I loved watching these poker shows because I found the dynamics fascinating. You got uh, a bunch of people around the table with millions and millions of dollars on the line and they're constantly trying to bluff or they're constantly trying to determine do I have a stronger hand than that person and and the dynamics of like y you're having to gamble on essentially their gut instinct I, I would just watch it fascinated because um, they, they try to they, they would try to determine okay this person just made a big bet and they'd like stare at them and try to figure out are they bluffing or do they really have a good hand and I, I found it uh, interesting to watch one of the the phrases that became a lot more popular in pop culture because of these poker shows was the phrase all in it, it was the most exciting thing that could happen on these shows of people sitting at a table uh, and what would happen is occasionally right someone would look at their hand and either they had a great hand or they were bluffing and they would say, I'm all in, meaning they would push all their chips to the middle of the table. And this was surprising because, you know, if you run out of chips, you're out of the game. The whole point is take everyone else's chips, don't lose yours. And so the idea of putting all your chips in the middle, that's dangerous. Usually people are, you know, they're going through hundreds of hands, they're putting a little bit in. Hey, if, if I lose, I'm still in the game, I still got these chips. But occasionally, like I said, someone would usually, after some consideration, go, I'm all in. And it was like, whoa, this, this could be their last hand. They're going big or they're going home, but they're, they've thrown caution to the wind. And on this one hand, instead of hundreds and hundreds of hands, instead of this long play, they're saying all of it on this one hand. Well, going all in is not something that only happens in poker. Uh, there are times in our lives where we choose 
that we want to go all in on something. I don't know if any of you have um, uh, played sports maybe in high school. Like I, I played baseball in high school, and I was an all-in guy. Man, I, I, I had the uniform on. I was there early for every game. I showed up to every practice. Uh, I was a starting pitcher, so I didn't even play every game, but I went to every game, and I'd show up and be like, uh, the coach would be like, who wants to coach first base? And I'd be like, me, I'm in. I, I, I want to do that. I want to be involved. I want to help my team win. I was an all-in guy, and it was frustrating if there were other people who didn't seem to care because I was like, I, I want to win for us to win. We've got to be trying our hardest. I mean, can you imagine like in professional sports if the left tackle for the Ravens was like, yeah, I like to take about seven to ten plays off during the game, just kind of daydream. I don't really, I don't really try very hard, conserve energy. We'd be furious because we'd be like, no, in order for our team to win, everyone has to be all in. That's why the Orioles don't win. They're not all in. <laughs> it's the whole problem. <laughs> Um, uh, another, another situation I can think of where we go all in that, that's fairly common in our society is marriage, right? We look at someone and we say, okay, all the rest of my days with you, all of them. That, that's a big all in right there, yeah. And so, and so that, that's one that, that we see fairly commonly. There are other situations where uh, we, we may not feel like we have a choice. We have to go all in. So uh, let me tell you a story uh, that, that about a time where I felt I had no choice but to go in. Uh, hopefully you'll enjoy this. Those of you watching online, uh, feel free to react loudly in Starbucks or wherever you're at to it, uh, and, and people can ask you what, what, what's going on. So last summer, I took my daughter on an adventure to South Africa. Here's why. I stole this idea from a book. I've told each of my kids when you turn 13, you can choose an adventure anywhere in the world, and you get to go on it. Either me or your mom will take you on that adventure. So my oldest daughter, a year and a half ago, she turned 13, and I said, have you decided where you want to go, what you want to do, what your adventure is for your 13-year-old adventure? And she said, yes, I want to swim with great white sharks. <laughs> and I said, that's awesome. Yeah, we're going to do that. Don't tell mom until after we get back. Uh, and so, and so I, I, I got to work. I said, okay, you got it. So I, uh, uh, the first thing I said was, okay, where can we go? And it has to be either New Zealand or South Africa. That's where you can do this. And, and so we decided South Africa. She decided South Africa. So I started planning. The first thing I said was, okay, we got to get our passports together, get that process going. That takes a while, lots of documentation, interviewing. Uh, you know, she's a minor, so they had the interviewer special and all this stuff. And uh, uh, so, so we get that process going, and, and I start planning everything else. Hey, where are we going to stay? You know, w when do we rent a car? Where do we want to go in the country? We got to fly around a little bit. What adventures do we want to do? So we found out you can hang out with penguins on a beach and snorkel with seals and go on safaris. So we were like, yeah, we're going to do all that stuff. And then I also had to find a place that would take us out to swim with great white sharks. And I wanted to find one that was pretty good about bringing you back from swimming <laughs> with great white sharks. So I found one of those. So finally, after months of planning, the day came. Uh, and, and we had to go to BWI at 6 a.m. in the morning, and, and, uh, and I was doing this as cheap as possible, so I got some cheap tickets, which you'll recognize why they were cheap in a minute. So we got on the plane, and we had to fly to Detroit first, which you might recognize as the opposite direction from South Africa. So we flew there, and then we had a 12-hour layover in Detroit. <laughs> So if you have any questions about the Detroit airport, I'm your guy. I know all about it. Uh, I know which Chick-fil-A is the good one in the Detroit airport. I can, I can hook you up. Finally, after 12 hours, I think I read like a book and a half just in that time. Uh, finally, we got on the plane. We flew 10 hours to Amsterdam, and then we had a two-hour layover, and then we flew 12 hours down to South Africa. So it was a long journey. It was 33 hours from when we got to BWI to when we arrived in Cape Town. I had the cheap tickets, so these are, these are bad seats in the back, babies crying around us. We're exhausted. I never want to see an airplane again when we get off of this thing, knowing that in two weeks I'm probably going to have to come back uh, and, and, and as long as I survive the great white shark thing, which, which I did, uh, funnily enough. Uh, and so we get there, and I'm like, man, finally, thank the good Lord above, off that plane. We're here. The adventure can start after 33 hours, after t uh, that last 12-hour flight. All we got to do is go through customs, and then, and then we'll rent our, we get our rental car, and we, we proceed on. It's going to be amazing. So we go into the customs line. It's late. It's like 10 p.m. Nobody else is in the airport. We're the only plane coming off. We're the only ones there, so it's not a long wait. And I get to the front of the line, 
and the customs lady's there, and I, and I hand her my passports, and I, I'm the kind of guy who, I, I want to be super helpful, Mr. Helpy Helperton, so that you like me, so I've got them open to the right page, like, here you go, here's mine, here's hers, right page is open, and she takes them, and she looks at them, and she looks at my daughter, and she says, how old is she? And I said, she's 13. She goes, okay. Um, she said, since she's a minor, uh, I just need her birth certificate, a copy of her mom's passport, and a letter from her mom saying you can bring her into the country by yourself. And I said, I don't have any of those things. And she said, then you can't come in my country. And I started laughing. And she didn't have a big sense of humor because she said, what's funny? (laughs) And I said, oh, I just flew halfway around the world and didn't realize I needed to bring that information. And now I'm horrified. This is just nervous reaction. I said, I said, okay, so, so what do I do? And she said, well, you give me what I want, or in one hour, the plane you just got off of is going back to Amsterdam, and you're going to be on it. And I said, so what do we do? (laughs) And she just kept saying, you give me what I want. And so about five times I said this, and after about the fifth time, that's when I realized, oh, I have to go all in. What else was I going to do? Was I going to (laughs) go, oh, well, sorry, sweetheart, daddy tried, let's go. Like, that's not happening. I've just, I've just spent a day and a half getting here. I'm all in. I said, so I looked at her. I said, ma'am, I wasn't going to just walk away from the window and give up. I said, ma'am, I want to give you what you want. How do I give you what you want? And, and, and finally, and I, I, said, I, said, I said, look, I'll, I'll hire a courier. I'll FedEx it overnight. I'll do whatever you want. I knew in my mind, I'm like, this could cost thousands of dollars. I didn't care. I was all in. I'm not leaving this window until we figure this out. I flew halfway around the world, once in a lifetime adventure for my daughter. What's it going to take? I'll do it. And so finally she said, well, if you send me pictures, if you show me pictures on your phone, I'll see if my supervisor will approve that. So meanwhile, I had told my wife, do not call me when I'm over there because I don't know how expensive, (laughs) like I, I don't know how expensive those minutes are. I'm not calling you. We can text. We can email. That's fine. But there's going to be no phone calls. And as soon as she said that, I was like, beep, boop, 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 boop. Hey, hey, it's me. Yeah. And I'm immediately like, I'm sure she can hear the panic in my voice of, I need you to stop what you're doing, get these following things. And my wife told me, I have to tell you all, she's the true hero of this story. She told me I had to say that. She got everything out of the fire safe, got it all together, got it over to me. Uh, I showed it to the lady. She calls over her supervisor, and after hemming and hawing, finally, um, he gives me the answer. Oh, you want the answer? Oh, okay. So, so then he says, okay, fine. Well, uh, I'll let you in. Make sure you print this off before, before you come back through. I said, yes, sir, A-OK, will do. Roger Wilco, no problem. What kind of paper? You know, and, and I'll do whatever you want. I was all in. And after the us through, I told my daughter, I said, listen, I said, don't run, but walk as fast as you can next to me. <laughs> We're getting out of this airport and getting in the rental car. I figure if I can get away from the airport, they can't put me back on that plane because the 15 minutes it took my wife to get that stuff was like three years of my life coming off. Like, when are they, I hope she gets it here before they tell me I have to get back on that plane. I didn't have a choice. I went all in. It was all or nothing, go for broke. I couldn't just go, ah, well, hopefully something works out. No, I, 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 I put everything on the line to make sure that went through. Here's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about the beginning of the church. And I don't mean lighthouse church. I mean the church as in back when the apostles, Peter and John, started preaching about the death and the resurrection of Jesus to people in Jerusalem. Uh, And all of this that I'm going to base what I talk about today is out of a book called The Acts of the Apostles, or just Acts for short. It's right after the Gospels, which makes sense. We have four books that describe, here's what Jesus said and did in his life. And so the next book is, so here's what we did as a result. So in the first few chapters of Acts, the church is already growing like crazy. People are uh, hearing the news about Jesus. They're believing in him. They start to gather to pray and to worship. And the church is born. When we get to Acts 3, there's a story about how Peter and John go to the temple to worship, and when they get there, they perform in the name of Jesus an incredible healing. A man who hasn't walked his whole life, he's 40 or 40 years old, over 40 years old, has never walked. In the name of Jesus, they heal him. The man gets up, starts jumping, running, 
praising God. It's, it's, it's an amazing, incredible miracle. And the religious leaders in Jerusalem get very concerned about this. The reason being that Jesus had been a problem for them. These were people who had power, and power brings influence and money and, and things that they wanted. Well, when Jesus was teaching and preaching and doing miracles, people started paying more attention to Jesus than to them. It started to threaten their influence and therefore threaten their power and their money. So they killed Jesus because of that. They helped to kill Jesus. And they figured, hey, when we get rid of this guy, everything's going to go back to normal. We'll have all the stuff that we want, the control we want, no problem. But really quickly, after this whole ordeal, you've got these two uneducated rubes, fishermen, show up in the temple, perform this incredible miracle, and Jerusalem is abuzz about what happened, what's going on. And so these religious leaders call in Peter and John, and, and they, they want to determine what's going on here. Is this going to be a problem for us? So I'm going to read uh, out of Acts chapter 4, which is uh, the primary chapter I'm working out of today. By the way, if you're not already on like a Bible reading plan, if you like the parts of the Bible that are stories, like those are, those are for me, those are my favorite parts of the Bible, the stories, uh, Acts is a great book for that. I would encourage you, uh, just start reading a chapter a day over the next week and read through the first seven chapters of Acts over the next week. It's a fantastic part. Uh, but let me read Acts chapter 4, verses 7 through 20, uh, about what happens when these religious leaders want to confront Peter and John. It says, They brought in the two disciples and demanded, By what power or in whose name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and conferred among themselves. What should we do with these men, they asked each other. We can't deny that they have performed a miraculous sign, and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. But to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. So they called the apostles back in and commanded them, Never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. Well, boom, that's an all-in moment right now, right there. You want us to obey you rather than God? Fat chance on that happening. And listen, this is not just big blustery talk from Peter and John. The people who they're standing in front of who are threatening them, they killed Jesus. There's real danger here for Peter and John. And in fact, Peter, just weeks before this, had been standing in the yard of one of the men that's now threatening him. And Peter was so scared about what would happen to him that he denied that he even knew who Jesus was. Now, they're saying, shut up or else, and Peter is saying, not a chance. I'm all in on this. Something's different. Peter's all in, and he has a boldness in him that didn't exist those weeks earlier. There's a reason that this book is called the Acts of the Apostles rather than the Beliefs of the Apostles. The change that happened in Peter wasn't just about a belief. Peter already believed that Jesus was the Messiah when he denied knowing him weeks earlier. In fact, in Matthew 16, there's an instance where Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. Peter believed that Jesus was the Messiah. But when the moment came earlier that that belief 
could lead to pain and suffering and death, Peter bailed. Peter said, yeah, you know what? I got a big pot of chips, and I've put some of them in with Jesus. I believe he's Messiah, but just in case this thing doesn't work out, I'm going to hold some back. But now, when Peter's standing before this group of men threatening him, he's saying, I'm with Jesus and nothing else. If you're going to kill me, if you're going to harm me, so be it. So Peter's beliefs, now that he's all in, make it impossible for him not to live it out. He has to act out what he believes on now that all of his chips are in on this belief. I want to submit to you, my friends, my brothers and sisters, that church has always been a place for people who are all in on Jesus to gather together. Yeah. In fact, I want to read for you a description of the the beginning of the church. Just a few verses after that story, Peter and John going, preaching boldly, you're not going to shut us up no matter what, we're all in. Look at the kind of community that forms around people who are hearing this message and start to join the body of believers. This is Acts 4, again, verses 32 through 35. It says, All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them, because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Ah, that, that's an all-in community. Now, if you're worried that TC is about to lead the most awkward offering of all time, where he's asking me to give my house and my land and my car to him, that's not what I'm doing. That'll be at the end of the service. <laughs> no, if, if you hear that, and right, right now if you're a guest, you're like elbowing your friend like, what have you brought me to? What's going on here? If, if I read that and what you hear is communism or communalism or socialism or fascism um, or some other political ideology, that's not what's happening here. The big difference is this. No one is forcing anybody to do it. The people in that story, these, this group of believers were voluntarily saying, I'm all in and I want to include my belongings, or at least some of my belongings, into that. Now, that's a whole different picture than what we see in America or even in our world today as it regards churches. When we talk about church, what's the kind of stuff we say? We say, hey, did you go to church this weekend? I go to Lighthouse Church. I used to go to another church, but now I go to that church. But when we read Acts chapter 4, there is no idea that church is something you go to or attend The idea is that church is something you do, something that you are. That's a whole different idea. So I think that's why in verse 32 it says the believers were of one heart and mind. It was a group of people who had all said, I'm all in. It was was equally, we're all in on this together. That's so different from saying I attend a church. For these first century believers, they said, they didn't say, oh yeah, I'm going to start attending that church. They said, that's my community now. That's my family. That's my tribe. And I'm going to invest whatever I have. Whatever I have to offer, I want to contribute it so that the community, the family, the tribe can benefit and grow. Now listen, I already jokingly told you, I'm not after your wallet today. In the two years I've been here, we've never taken an offering in Lighthouse Service. We're not taking one today. I'm not after your wallet. I am after your heart today. And I'll tell you that the idea that church is something on a to-do list, just a checkbox to check off during my week, is totally foreign to what we see as we read about that first group of believers. Uh, There's there's something called the Pareto Principle or or the the, the 80-20 rule. And here's what the 80-20 rule says. It says that in an organization of any size, um, if you look at what's happening, 20% of the people will be doing 80% of um, the work or getting 80% of the results. Uh, So so if you you work in a company that has sales department, most likely your top 20% of the sales team is getting 80% of the sales. And unfortunately, we, we, we see that because it's kind of a 
something that exists with human nature. We, we see it in the church. In fact, here at Lighthouse Glen Burnie, about 20% of the people who call this their home campus are part of our serving teams, part of our movement teams. And so 20% of the people are doing about 80% of the volunteering. Now, the reason I mention this is because I, I think that leads us away from what the Holy Spirit wants us to have in our community, whereby we are all part of this body of believers. In fact, Jesus says something that I find very challenging in Matthew 16, 24. He says, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. Man, that doesn't leave a lot of room for half in, half out, or putting a few chips in the middle. By the way, if you're like, ah, that was probably just a figure of speech, take up your cross, follow me, it was just something people said. It was not. Like, like I wouldn't be like, um, hey, I need, I need some of y'all to help me move uh, in a couple weekends, so pick up your electric chair and come with me. You'd be like, what? Like, that, that, that doesn't make sense. I'm, you're, that's getting weird and awkward, and I'm not, I'm not into that degree. So when Jesus said that, it was stark. It was intimidating. It was as weighty to them as it is to us when we hear that. And it doesn't leave room, like I said, for us to play it safe. I'll, I'll, I'll keep most of my chips back, put a little bit in with this community of believers, with, with the body of Christ. Um, when, I, when I read that verse, take up your cross and follow me, it reminds me of a story uh, from a book I read this week. Those of you who know me will be shocked that I read a book, of course. Uh, I read a book about the genocide in Rwanda back in 1994. Heavy topic. Um, and I, I'm old enough that I remember this being in the news. I didn't really understand much about it. But essentially, uh, there was a group that, that was called the Hutus and a group called the Tutsis in Rwanda, and the Hutus decided to slaughter the Tutsis. Th I mean, to, to the level of genocide, the level of Nazis and Jewish people. Just, we're going to kill them all. And they did. They killed about 800,000 people over, I think, about 100 days. Awful. Unbelievable. So there was a woman named Sister Felicity, and she was a Hutu, the group not being killed, the group forming the murder squads and killing people. And she decided she was not okay with this. And so she decided to shelter Tutsis, the people who were being hunted, who were being killed. And so in, her, in the home where she was at, she welcomed in about 30 Tutsis. She helped others escape, run off, get out of the country. But eventually the murder squads found out, and they showed up at her door. And they told her, we're going to kill everyone in your house. They're the bad kind. They're Tutsis. They're bad. We kill them. They said, but good news, you're a Hutu, we will not kill you. And Sister Felicity looked at the murder squad and she said, I will stand with the people of my home either in life or in death. And so they proceeded to kill everyone in her house and they went to leave. They left her alone. And she stopped them and she said, I demand that you kill me too. You killed everyone in my house, you must kill me. That's all in. That's all in on a belief where she said, these people are worthy of dignity and life, and I am all in on that. I'm not pushing some of my chips in. Yeah, I'll help them, but oh, I'm able to, I can cash back out and, and, and spare my life. She was all in. That, in my opinion, is a picture of what Jesus is calling us to do, putting our life in no matter what. It's very different from the idea that I go to church each week or church is something I do during the week or maybe not even every week. Now, at this point, maybe you're worried like, okay, TC said he's not after money. He's after something. Like, like he's, he, he's hitting this one pretty hard. I, I am, here's what I am trying to do. I'm trying to inspire you, to invite you, and to challenge you. And by the way, quick clarification. If you're new to Lighthouse, uh, and you're, you're checking this place out, you're not sure if this is where God's calling you to, to have your family, your tribe, your community, that's fine. Hey, you should evaluate if this is a community, a family you want to pour yourself into. That'd, that'd, be, that'd be pretty wild to show up week one and be like, I'm all in, the whole thing. Like, evaluate, figure out, is this where God wants me to plug in? Do that. But if you've been here, if this is your home, if you've been here a year or more and you've never said, hey, I'm all in, I want to invite you and I want to challenge you to evaluate putting yourself all in. Here's why. Because the term body of Christ I've been using is something Paul the Apostle developed. 
He uses that term very intentionally. He even talks about the fact that different body parts have different functions. I have an eye and I have a foot, and if my eye tried to do the job of the foot, it would be terrible. And if the foot tried to do the job of the eye, that wouldn't work either. Or if I had five eyes and no arms, that would be very challenging for me to function in our world today. What Paul is saying is that in our community, this body of Christ, each of us has a role. We have an ability, we have talents, we have resources, we have a story. And if someone is not contributing themselves, what they have to that body, well, then that body is going to have a limp. Without you, we are limping. Because I can't do the things you do. I don't have your story. I don't have your influence with your circle of friends and family and coworkers. So without you, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get along as best we can, but we're not whole. We can't run flat out as we were intended to without you. So I want, I'm asking, I'm inviting, I'm challenging you not to show up here and say, you know, well, what am I going to get out of it today? I hope it's good today. I want you saying, hey, how can I bless and encourage and help others with what I have? Instead of holding it back, what can I get out of it? I want you saying, how can I give this in a way that's going to transform this community, this group? Because without you, we're losing out on what you have to offer. We need you involved in Love Weekend. We need you serving. We need you in small groups. We need you going on mission trips around here. Because if you don't, we don't have a replacement for you. Only you have the gifts, abilities, talents, and story that God has given you. Now, when I read that those early believers were one in heart and mind, I tell you, that's our goal. That's where we want to get to, where we're all putting ourselves all in. And we're all of one heart and mind. You might look at me and say, TC, in today's world, how is that going to be possible? Social media, all the bickering and sniping, political parties fighting back and forth constantly, um, you know, different, different socioeconomic statuses and cultures. And uh, th- there's just no way in our world today that any group of people can be of one heart and mind. In fact, TC, that's impossible. And I would agree with you. With us, it is impossible but with God, all things are possible. That's the whole point of the church is that we're not doing this on our own, but that we're giving what we have to the Holy Spirit and letting Him knit us together so that we can become one heart and mind through His power. Can I, can I, can I get you just to imagine and dream with me for a minute? What would that look like? If if. All of us didn't say, I go to Lighthouse, but we were like, Lighthouse is my family, and 100% of us were giving 100%. We would change the world. I know that because that's what happened in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, and here we sit in Glen Burnie, Maryland, 2,000 years later, worshiping Jesus because those believers heard about this and said, I don't just believe, I'm all in on that, and the gospel spread everywhere because of it. I, I don't want to put down any other organization, a church, or anything, but I'll tell you, the world doesn't need one more organization filled with half-hearted people, right? We got enough of those. But a place where 100% gave 100%, man, that'd be amazing. Now listen, if you're new, if you're a guest here today, at this point you're probably like, I'm 90% sure this is a cult. <laughs> Let me reassure you, you're not going to have to sign a billion-year contract for the Sea Org like they do in Scientology or something like that. If you go, by, if you go to our experts' table or tent afterwards to say, hey, I want to be all in, and they try to get you to sign a billion-year contract, you should back away, all right? That's, that's fine. I, I, I'm fine with that. Because we want a community where everyone wants to be all in because we see the value of doing that. Honestly, even if I had the ability to force you to be all in with your time and your ability, your resources and whatnot, um, you wouldn't have your heart and mind into it. We wouldn't be of one heart and mind. So even if I could force that, we still wouldn't get what only the Holy Spirit is able to do. So I'm looking for people who are saying, I want to make God's priorities my priorities. I'm going to love people because God says love people. I want to give what I have because that's what God invites me to do. Now, here's what I want to do. I told you I want to inspire you today. I want to share with you just a handful of stories of what God is doing with the 20% around here right now. And listen, as you're hearing these, just like, it's amazing what God is doing. 
For instance, uh, here's one person who shared with us a story about how they had such a bad concussion they couldn't drive and they were cut off from community, but then they found out we have online small group, and so they're part of a community instead of being isolated and cut off. Here's another person who shared with us that when they started coming to Lighthouse, they weren't even sure that Jesus was God. But when they were praying to him, they heard him say, I need you to trust me. And so they got baptized, and they now lead one of our small groups. Here's a, here's a, a lady who heard a sermon here at Lighthouse about obedience, and as a result, she ended up donating a kidney to someone she had never met on the West Coast. <laughs> amazing. Here's another person. This is a, a friend of mine. Uh, they started coming to church right after they got a DUI and were facing some jail time. And out of that, they started attending. They got plugged into CR. And now they're about to have that interlock device taken off of their car. And Jesus has transformed their whole life. Uh, we, we received a message from a lady who told us that she had had a miscarriage and out of the pain and grief she had turned to alcohol and after she realized that wasn't fulfilling any uh, uh, of the needs she had for healing, she got involved at church, she got baptized and plugged in and she's coming here and finding the healing she needed. That's what God's doing with 20%. That's amazing. I don't know about you, but it if I've got to invest my life somewhere, I'd like to do it somewhere where, where God's doing that kind of stuff. And on the flip side, for somebody serving, uh, I, 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 uh, I want to tell you about Cindy Nice Warner. She's my greeter lead over at Lighthouse Catonsville. And she, uh, she started attending Lighthouse right about the same time my family did. We got to know her early on because Cindy uh, one day pulled into a McDonald's parking lot and she saw a car with the LH sticker on the back of the car and she walked into McDonald's and said, who's got the LH sticker on the back of their car? <laughs> and it was my wife. My wife had the kids there in the playland and, and my wife was like, me? Like, do I, what, how's this going to go? And Cindy came over, started talking to my wife, struck up a fast friendship and Cindy would just always tell us how much she loved Lighthouse. We just always had a connection with her because of that. Well, right when we were launched in Lighthouse Catonsville just five, six months ago, Cindy came up to me right here in the lobby and she said, TC, I feel like God's telling me I need to get involved. I need to, I need to start contributing. And I said, okay, Cindy, lead my greeter team. I, I need you. Come on, do it. And Cindy's been leading it since it's launched. And I asked her, I said, Cindy, could you send me uh, a message telling me about what impact that's had for you when you went all in? You loved it. You were participating. You loved Lighthouse. And you said, I don't just want to love it anymore. I want to give what I have to it. Here's what she said. She said it's had a huge impact. I feel so much more connected to my faith community, Lighthouse. I know people at church. I love being a partner in ministry with others, serving on a team. By being connected and being on a team, I see God using our gifts together to accomplish so much more than we could accomplish on our own. By serving, I feel knitted into the Lighthouse Catonsville family. I have a sense of purpose that I'm using my gifts to benefit my church family. People like Cindy don't show up saying, ah, I hope it's good today. I hope it's Sammy. Ah, it's not. Mm. <laughs> oh, you guys like that one. Oh. <laughs> That's, I'll tell you. That... <laughs> I was not, I was not pandering to clapping, yeah, man, I know you're just clapping for my shirt, I know what's going on here, I know how it goes, That's, uh, that was the weirdest applause I've ever received, thank you, I wasn't trying to get applause, listen, I know how this goes, I know some of you come up to me before the lobby and you're like, hey, who's preaching, <laughs> I know how it goes. People like Cindy don't come in saying, ah, I hope it's good today. People like Cindy come in going, I can't wait to see what God wants to do today, and I'm going to be a part of it. I don't want to miss out on that. I want people who show up, and they're saying, I care about our kids and our teenagers and our single moms and our widows and our widowers. I care about encouraging and blessing people. Who can I be a blessing to today when I come to my family gathering today or throughout the week? Who can I 
invest my life into because we're family. We're all in together. When, I, when we read Acts chapter 4, when it ends, it says there's no needy persons among them. And again, it wasn't political. It wasn't forced. It wasn't contrived. People only gave what they wanted to give. It was totally voluntary. People still owned other things. They were willing to say to the Holy Spirit, here's what I have. What do you want to do with it? I'm willing to give it to you if it's what you want. Listen, instead of you giving me your house or your car, what if you open your house up to a small group or to someone in need? What if instead of giving your car, you find out, hey, someone needs a ride to the doctor or or needs help getting to work to get back on their feet? What if you give what you have to the Holy Spirit in that capacity rather than handing over, transferring over ownership? I... um, I tell you, when I was, when I was a new believer, uh, and I was so amazed by God's generosity of salvation and all God gave to me, I responded at that time. And I, so I started just being as generous as I could. I, I, when I got a new car, I gave my, my old car away. I had, I had computers I gave away. I had a n- number of things I gave away to people. And listen, that car ran another 100,000 miles. It wasn't a pretty car, but it ran, and I gave it to someone to be a blessing to them because I knew they needed it. They were, they were a brother of mine in the church, and I said, hey, I, I just want to give this to you instead of trying to get money out of it. Now listen, if God told me to give away my nice newer truck, I'd have a harder time with that right now, right? But here's what I realized as I was preparing this message. First of all, I'm preaching to myself and y'all are just listening right now. But I realized I went from that kind of generosity all in to, you know, I uh, got, got a better vehicle, had more responsibilities with my family, and I started getting to the point where I was like, oh, let me, let me, I, need to, I need to pile my chips. I need, I need my chip pile to be a little higher on my side. And I got to the point where I was just kind of, just by default, just holding on to stuff. And I realized as I was preparing this, I was like, I, I, I need to get back to that place where I live with open hands. Holy Spirit, everything I have is yours, and I'll do whatever you want because here's what I've learned. If God asks me to give up something that I don't want to give up, it's because he has a blessing for me far greater than what I could have had just holding on to what I got. So if my choice is only hold on to the chips I can have or go all in and see God's jackpot, what God's kingdom is going to do grow, I I want to be on that side. So I had to go on a prayer walk, and I was like, all right, God, everything I have, if if you want it, please speak to me, because I've learned that God is more generous than me. I've told you guys a little bit of my story before I got here. uh, I was in a moment where I I was looking for a job, and I went for a run, and I told God, God, I need a job. And he said to me, do you just want a job, or do you want my best? Because my best comes in my way. And I was like, okay, I want your way. And it was challenging, difficult. But look what I get to do. I get to be here with you guys. I mean, I wouldn't trade this for anything. Mm. So I know if I just try to hold on to what I can get, I'm not going to be anywhere near as happy as if I live open-handed, invest in God's kingdom, give my all, go all in, and receive the blessings that come out of that. So listen, I want to make sure, before we're leaving here today, that none of you feels like you're being guilted or I'm trying to force, I've been trying, I've tried to be real, real open about that. I'm not trying to do that. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, the Apostle Paul writes, you should never give out a coercion. I, if you feel like I'm manipulating you, coercing you, forcing you, ignore me. Straight up. You got, I'm telling you, Paul says ignore me. You are definitely not sub-quality if, if you're not serving or something like that, okay? You need to go all in with what God's given you. And if for you, if that's caring for your kids in this season, hey, do it. Love them. Care for them. I'm just inviting you, make sure that you're living hands open and saying, God, I'm all in. Everything I am and have is for you, and I want to build the body of Christ. So wherever you're at, I want to invite you, dive in. Being here for what I can get out of it says things like, I'm only going to attend when I feel like it. Being all in might say, hey, I go to multiple services so I can sit one and serve one because I want to make sure that I receive and that I also give. I'm here for what I can get might say, um, man, I hope it's good this week. But all in is going to say something like, I'm going to invite my friends and family and neighbors who haven't heard the message of Jesus so that they can hear about the hope that is transforming my life. It looks like saying, who can I be a blessing to this week? Ten years ago, Lighthouse was a church of around 200 people getting ready to move to Glen Burnie, Maryland. God has grown us tenfold in that time, in those ten years, largely because we've got an incredible group of people who pour themselves out, go all in. That 20%, 
has just done incredible stuff. The question I have for you is this, that I want you to take before God and consider yourself throughout this week. Where is Lighthouse going to be 10 years from now? And I think the answer to that is that it depends on you, that you're going to decide that. If we just give scraps to this community, in 10 years it'll be a community of scraps. And can God do miracles with scraps? Heck yeah, look at me, all right? God can do amazing stuff with scraps. But why would we ask him to? The, the first believers in Acts in Jerusalem, they didn't say, eh, yeah, I'll, I'll put a little bit into that. They went all in, and God changed the world through them. So I'm asking you, I'm inviting you, I'm challenging you. Dive in from wherever you're at. After service, we've got our experts at tables in the tent there. They can talk to you about anything getting, you want to get plugged in with. If you're like, I don't even know what my gifts are, talk to them. They're trained. They'll help you figure that out. We want to talk to you about, hey, maybe for you it's serving. Maybe for you it's being in a small group. Maybe for you it's getting involved in CR. Maybe for you it's Love Weekend. Maybe for you it's um, finding out about being on the next time we do mission trips around here. Dive in wherever you're at. Put more in. Put all in and see what God will do with that. Can I pray for us as we wrap up here today? Jesus, Thank you that you are an all-in God. You've held nothing back from us. You left heaven. You came to earth, and you gave your life for us. And then, Jesus, you let us benefit from that. You give us salvation. You give us joy. You pour your Holy Spirit out, and you've promised us that you're going to make all things new, and we get to be part of your kingdom. You've held nothing back. You're all in with us. God, we want to be all in with you, but you know us human, we're fragile, we're frail and we default to holding on to what we can hold on to God would you help us to trust you enough to go all in to live open handed before you with everything you've given us, I mean God it's just on loan with the things you've given us, you've been so generous how much more if we live with open hands and let you work in us and through us. Because God, our prayer is that the very face of this world would be transformed by the power of your Holy Spirit. And you said you want to do that through us. So God, help me. Help my brothers and sisters that we would go all in, that you would accomplish your purposes through our meager offerings, but our open hearts. And we ask that you would make us one heart and one mind together that we would point people to you, Jesus, not to us, but to you. We pray all this in your name. Amen.